from outside the community start coming. Once they couldn't get access to the pool, that's the jumping over the fence, that's uh, the cursing out the security guard, that's, and, th and then the fights broke out, and then that's what the police call. So this perception that hmm. my community and people that were living there said, oh, it's a black party, let's call the police, we don't want black kids in our pool, it's totally false. Different people with different accounts of what happened at that Dallas area pool party. It's become a national debate. Now, the man you just heard from said that the incident was not about race from his perspective. It was about some unruly kids. Now, regardless of the causes, let's save a lot of time because just about everybody agrees that the officer who threw down that 14-year-old girl overreacted in a big way. And the 14-year-old kid who shot this video disagrees with the other guy. This is what this young man had to say. You can see in part of the video where he tells us to sit down and he kind of like skips over me and tells all my African-American friends to go sit down. All right, now that 14-year-old kid who shot the video um, was one of the folks uh, who got a front uh, row seat to the incident. And that incident is sparking protests and calls for the officer to be fired. And as you just heard, we're getting word right now that, in fact, that officer has resigned just minutes ago. All right, I want to bring into our panel Darren Porcher. Uh, he's a retired NYPD lieutenant. We're going to be talking about a few issues with him. But let's talk about what happened in Dallas and the, and the perspectives on it. And talk about it, um, if you could, from a police perspective and then, obviously, races been the dominant issue with so many of these things, whether it's from Missouri to Staten Island to name the flashpoint in this country, South Carolina, now in Dallas. Police get called to an incident. Mm -hmm. What I'm fascinated is when they get there, how do they know? All they're hearing is that black kids jump in the fence probably, um, causing fights in the pool area. How do they know when they get to the scene which black kids had invitations to the thing? Um, lived in the community, had passes or whatever, permits to be there versus people coming in from somewhere else who aren't listening. How does an officer come on the scene and say, law-abiding black kid and troublemaking black kid? Well, the first thing an officer would do in a situation like that is stabilization. When I say, when I say stabilization, meaning make sure that the area is safe. They will call there for a dispute. Okay, once they, once they arrive at the scene, one of the first things is you want to stabilize the, uh, the area to make sure there's no problematic issues. Then you may want to confer with the homeowner to state, hey, what happened here? Because that's the most important thing. We want to know what happened. But as we move forward, we look at this particular instance, and we had an officer that grabbed a 14-year-old girl in a bikini and threw her to the floor. In my mind, I didn't see her as a threat because the bikini in no way, shape, or form oh, could I see. You, me, everybody, we all talk about this is table, Darren, and nobody thinks he should have pulled his gun, including you can even see the other officer put her hand on her shoulder right, like, exactly. cool it here, Let's okay? Let's quell the situation. But what we also heard is this is about minute 10 after the problem happened, okay? And when the cops came on the scene, this is reportedly, we've heard from various sources, that for the first nine minutes, a lot of the kids were telling the cops where they could go. They weren't listening. They weren't dispersing. They weren't doing whatever else. Forget what the book says. The reality and the, and the real-time emotions of some of the other cops. Forget the idiot who pulled his gun. At what point does the cop say, I've been telling you now, for five minutes, now going on 10 minutes, to stop doing what you're doing, you're taunting me, you're running away, or whatever else. What time does the cop say enough's enough here, okay? And they start, if not, you know, pulling a gun here, starting to grab the kids and putting them down or trying to detain them, and it starts to risk getting out of hand. There's no real delineation where, as you can state, okay, when this happens, that's when we're going to start taking people, uh, we're going to place people under arrest, put them down. It's something based on your experience as an officer. That's what's going to allow you to assess the situation and use the appropriate tactics to quell but the situation. But if a bunch of kids, if you say, listen, guys, I need you, get away from there, I need you to get against the thing, and they tell you where you can go, what you can go do to yourself and everything else, and that listening to you, right? The respect factor and needing to control the situation on the ground. For me, I've argued, we were talking about this last night, I think a lot of the problems we're having is cops aren't used to taking lip off some folks here. And when they get a lot of it, then they start either losing their minds or they're not, and then things escalate where it gets way out of hand. Like this guy when he pulls the piece here, but the kid's coming near him, okay? 
help me out with that part because in real time one it of, seems that's a big part of the problems we're having. Am key, I wrong? No, you're, you're very accurate. But one of the key points here as a police officer are strong conflict resolution skills. Your conflict, the, the best weapon that you have on the street is your mind. It's not your gun, it's not your fist. Your ability to speak to people. You can tell someone to get up against the wall and they may tell you, hey look, just get away from me buddy. Whereas I can speak to a person in a way where they'll be understanding and they'll abide by my commands. That's something that comes with just your time in the street, how you deal with people. So when you gave me that particular instance, when is enough enough, a lot of that is tooled based on your skills in troubleshooting situations. Oftentimes it could be, hey look sir, I need you to. I need you to get. I need you to get up against the wall. I need you to leave. Come on, f you. I'm sick and tired of this. Look, I understand all of that. You may be right, but today, if you can do this favor for me, and believe it or not, people feel a sense of empowerment when a cop says to them in the street, "Can you do me a favor? Can you leave?" Guys respect that, and they walk away. It doesn't work all of the time, but in most settings, it does. And you have to take in consideration if you're fighting with someone every time you engage them in the street. You're doing something wrong. Conflict, excuse me, conflict resolution is key in dealing with people in street encounters. Uh, well, Richard, what I mean, I'm, I'm glad you explained that because what we saw in the video, I mean, as I, the point I tried to make, this officer endangers the lives of other officers. You're right. We don't know what happened up to minute nine, but this guy is acting like Rambo. No debate. I mean. And, and, and you could tell the other cops are not comfortable with his behavior. They've got to back him up. And the point that I made last night, you know, would he have done that to a young lady in a bikini of, of another race? Where is the humanity in all of this? The problem is law enforcement, I know you're not going to say this, officer, they look at black on black crime, they deal with it every day, they feel that black youngsters are unruly, and then they roll on a situation like this and boom. But you can't do that. And so that's why he's resigned. And the only question as of now is what else is in his background that he doesn't want us to know? And how, well, much, know is, how much is the city going to pay in terms of millions? I don't know. Because they're gonna pay. We know that the, what was in his jacket, I guess, was there was another incident where he was at a, interesting enough, another pool party where he pulled down somebody's shorts and he body searched him, including, I guess, reportedly even uh, there was a harassment charge against a cop where he put a flashlight and checked his uh, behind or whatever. But he also was no, uh, voted cop of the year two years earlier. Um, now, he resigned. But if you take him out of the mix, it's still, this is, thankfully, there was no gunfire. Thankfully, nobody got really hurt here. But in microcosm, you see these tensions that are playing out in broad daylight uh, in any suburban city in America, and you wonder, what's the next state line going to be? What were you going to say, Andrew? There are versions of this cop on every police force in the country, and, and you know that if this was his reaction at this incident, that he's had other incidents where he either hasn't shown the respect to people that he was confronting or has crossed the line, maybe not to this degree, but certainly in other cases. Why does it seem like it's so difficult for good cops to, to basically turn on bad cops? I mean, if a bad cop... Like that, or the cop in South Carolina who was just indicted for, for shooting the suspect in the back and apparently planting the gun. Uh, there seems to be a level of protection that, that you get from, uh, from well, other wall. cops. Is there a blue wall? And how do you break that cycle? Wouldn't that help the overall uh, lack of respect that police seem to be getting from, from the communities they're policing? Well, when we look at police culture, police culture is a subculture like you're a subculture in media. So there's a sense of camaraderie that comes into play. However, there's a, systemic, there's a systemic culture within policing that needs to be changed. Believe it or not, these complaints are on a, de on a decline. We're not having as, as many complaints for police brutality as we've had in the past. But what's happening now, the sensationalism mm -hmm. of something be, everyone carries you around a camera video. phone. Right, exactly. So based on that, the sensationalism of you seeing a video turns this into a lightning bolt. And it's like, wow, we need to do something. But just going back to what do we do in terms of police culture to get officers that are good officers to turn on a bad officer? It's, once again, it's a, it's a systemic cultural problem that needs to be changed in police departments. Now, traditionally, when police, um, when officers, they, they go through the police academy, they get a speech from an internal affairs bureau, et cetera. Look, you need to do the right thing. If you do something wrong, turn in your partner. However, 
these people, the, when I say these people, meaning these officers, they work together. And there's a trust, there's a bond. And they can save and each other's lives. You can, exactly. You never exactly. crack that blue wall of but, silence. But you know what? Never. Dominic, but, you go in the community, and I'm sure you are too, Darren, about one thing. You, every single person we've had on this table of color, whether they've been an officer, they've been a dad like yourself, they've been a person of uh, a clergy or whatever, they've all had, a, had the talk with the kid. You get pulled over if it's their son, how you put the hands on the steering wheel, we've all heard it, okay? But my question is, and I'm not pleased before you send in the emails, I'm not in any way condoning what that idiot cop did by pulling the gun or any of the other egregious actions we've seen cops do. But I just remember, and I was no angel here, that if the cops came up on me and they told me to get whatever, you did my what lips you. shut up right. and I was not going to mess with the cops. Even in that clip, again, they should know how to do conflict resolution. But it, it, there is a level, it seems that there's always this center point that happens when some cops can't handle um, getting lip or disrespect from people, especially some kid, and then it escalates out of hand, and then you got the idiot doing the Rambo routine. My question is, when did it become so permissible to talk to the cops this way when they're trying to control the situation? Rich, you bring up a very valid point, and that's our job as society, as citizens, when, we, when we're engaged by officers, we have a responsibility. That responsibility is whatever an officer tells us to do, provided it's lawful, we just abide by it. The key for us as civilians is to exit that encounter with police as quick as possible. Officer pulls you over, I need to see your license or registration, just show it to him. That's not the time to have a discourse of whether you did it or not. If you're standing at a location, police tell you to leave, just leave. It makes life so much easier on us as citizens in our society. Not saying that it's okay for an officer to violate someone's rights, but remember, there's a two-prong mm. approach here. One for civilians, the same holds true for police. Okay, we're going to keep this conversation going. On the other side, um, certainly an issue much closer to home. Forget about Texas. Um, media going nuts lately. Pick up a couple of the daily tabloids and you think the Big Apple is under a crime siege here. It's true, the murder rate is up compared to last year, but compared to the bad old days of a few decades ago, like people would love you to believe we're in, it's not even close. Is it time for everybody to calm down or are we starting to see an uptick in violence that's the beginning of a trend?